Hi there everyone, as you can see we are joined once again by our friend Matt Parker. It is never hard to get Matt to come and visit us here at the Royal Society, but it's even easier when he's trying to sell his book. I'll do pretty much any video at this point. <laughs> Alright. Humble Pie, if you see that in a shop or on the internet or in the links down below, you should buy it. Please buy it so I can stop doing these videos. <laughs> Now this book, as you can tell, is about errors, a comedy of maths errors. So we thought today we would make an objectivity video all about mistakes and blunders and things that were a bit misguided. And we've got a mixture of things that Keith has found, that Matt has requested. But the thing we're going to start with, which is my favourite, is a bulletproof bicycle. I can't wait to see it. So this is the unpublished stuff. Oh. Now this was devised by someone we've seen before on the channel, our squaring the circle chap. Indeed. Yes, yep. which James Grime got to talk about. Yeah. I'm in no way jealous. So you, you have second prize. Second prize yeah, second is the prize. bike. This is a guy called Charles Hudson. So he's out in Calcutta and he decides he's going to write to Thomas Young, one of the great scientists of all time, about his bulletproof bike. This is 1825 he's writing and here we go. This is for infantry rocketing their way across the plains in India. Not only does this umbrella keep the sun off your head, but it's also made of metal, so that keeps the bullets off your head as well. So if it's raining lead, you're fine. So it's bulletproof in so much as there's like a shield attached on an adjustable mm. That's right, yeah. stick. It'd be raining and you're like, oh, I'm uh, keeping dry. I guess. Bullets yeah. ahead. You That's go. a bigger concern. Boom. Mm. And it seems to be pivoting in the direction of the wheel as well. It does seem to be kind oh, of yeah. attached to this here. So maybe as you're charging the enemy on your bike, it pivots in the oh, correct direction. The direction yeah, yeah. Basically, you're levering yourself along on stirrups, oh, I think. Oh, there's like a, um, don't know what that mechanism is, but like a cam mm. shafty kind of thing. Looks like, yeah, so and then you just and steer it up and down. Alternately press, yeah, yeah. And was his vision to have an entire legion of these, like, yeah. would you see them roll, the thundering sound of, of dust. people <laughs> pumping the, the stirrups? That's right. I don't know if I'd call it a mistake. No. But it was possibly misguided. Surely it was a mistake that nobody <laughs> built one. <laughs> exactly, yeah. that's so true. <laughs> Next we're moving on to something that Matt requested. This is calendars and dates. We've got a few different manuscripts here. Most of, of these ones are to do with the calendar changes going on in the 1750s. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Fixed and movable feasts and festivals and terms for any time, past, present and future. That Indeed. is a big, bold open. But you can see here that part three is inscribed to the Earl of Macclesfield. Macclesfield, George Parker, becomes president of the Royal Society in 1752. What a Parker! We had to get him in, <laughs> and here he is in the Philosophical Transactions, and he's promoting the idea of changing the calendar. The Julian calendar tried to fix the mismatch between the Earth's orbit and seasons with a whole number of days in the year with a leap day or leap year every four years. And this is saying that England, who are still on the Julian calendar, should switch to the mathematically superior Gregorian calendar. The year was 11 minutes longer than it needed to be, which meant that the calendar would drift one day every 128 years. Three intercalary... Oh, instead of leap days, they were intercalary days? Mm -hmm. Should be admitted or dropped in every 400 years by reckoning all those years whole. So if it's a multiple of four, it is a leap year. If it's multiple of 100, it's not a leap year. If it's multiple of 400, it is again. I think we're going to need a leap year to fit this whole I thing. I know, it's so good. So he's pointing out the mistakes that were in the Julian calendar, yeah. which England was still trying to use and saying we should switch over to the superior Gregorian calendar. And this was what, 1750? 1750. And two years later, they had the Reform Act and they changed the calendar. They skipped a bunch of days and we've been Gregorian ever since. So this is another Parker before you pointing out historic mistakes and calling for change. This, this is the original humble pie. Wow. That's so good. So there was another thing that, Matt, you particularly wanted to see. We've talked Julian and Gregorian calendars, but there's the forgotten French Revolution calendar where they tried to decimalize the year by having like 10 days in the week and all these things. And I have never actually seen, I've hunted for this, a contemporary use 
of that calendar? Ah, uh, we've got lots. And you've done it? Okay, yeah, what have we got? got? What have we got? Lots, lots. Because, of course, on the title pages of books, you always get the year of publication. Of Therefore, anything published in France at this time would have occasionally the standard method, but also would have the oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, new yeah. method. So they're using both years at this yeah. point. Well, on, they haven't committed yet. On that particular book, yes. Oh, yeah, year four. That's it. Also, for a while, they ran both dates in the books, and now they're like, well, this is clearly here to stay. They, they probably wanted some overseas sales. Just, you, you know exactly. how that Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, right, right, right. And you can see who this is by. This is Simon Laplace. So a pretty big author. It is. Ah. That's phenomenal. So this oh, is quite. differential calculus. Oh, look. He's, oh, he's only equal to yep. 1797. Year five. Year five equals 17. So he's hedging. Yeah, he's done both. This one's another, another one. Three. Year three. Okay. And, and just finally, Laplace. Laplace. System, yeah, system of the world? Year, year seven. seven. That's so great. Matt, how long did this last? 12 years. And I don't think it was a mistake because they had a better method for leap years. They just skip one every 128 years, right. which is more accurate. We've got something here that we've pulled out. This is tracts. Yes, so this is tracts and it's to do with mistakes, which is, is the theme. On the composition of cheese and on practical mistakes in cheese making. Have you just put mistakes into the catalogue? Not guilty, it was <laughs> Rupert. It was oh, brilliant. We just, we just, Rupert's we just... just searched for mistakes. Yep. In the opinion of many persons, English cheese is not what it used to be in the good old time. This is 1858. 1858, wow. Of late years, a good deal of cheese has been imported into England from America, some of which is by no means bad. Wow. The majority, however, are inferior and are sold at a low price, being generally badly made and deficient in flavour. That's still kind that's of... That's not a bad description of American cheese. It doesn't mention how squeezy it is, though. I don't know if that's... I want to get to the mistakes. The inferior character, and especially the bad flavour of cheese, owes its origin in many cases to a want of proper care in handling the milk from which it has been made. Milk sometimes gets spoiled by dirty fingers before it passes into the pail. He then goes into quite a lot of detail about... Milk sometimes gets tainted by close proximity of pigsties or water closets or by underground drains. Don't make cheese in the toilet. Solid advice for a lot of food production, if mm. I'm being honest. If you want more details on this, you can make your way here to the Royal Society. Ask Keith more to bring up tracks 611 and you can read more than you ever imagined possible about mistakes made when making cheese. And if you want to read about mistakes made in mathematics, there you go. I was waiting for the ending cheese related pun from you, Brett. I know, yeah. I, it I, just I, never I, came. No, I thought I'd better end it before you start. Ah, right. <laughs> <laughs> this box alone seems like a an insight into I, this man's mind. I know. A lot of mathematicians have a box of puzzles and things at home. So for me, it feels like this is his box of puzzles and he was working on making his own. He's a popularizer of mathematics. He yeah. wants everyone to enjoy maths puzzles and so he's made them. That's so good.